When I was a little boy, I made little plastic models of uh, 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 rockets and, and submarines. System dynamics modeling has been around for about 50 years. Modeling is a great way to sort of understand complex processes and think about them. Scientific models are basically some kind of a abstraction of the reality. Increasingly what we've been doing in late 20th century and now 21st century is we're using the power of computers to create computational models. They get used when the system is so complicated that it is too difficult for your brain to keep track of everything that's happening and everything that would change if you made one little change to the model. So the value of the model, of course, is that it does simplify some things so you can understand certain things better. Certain things are very, very dangerous to do or impossible to do in schools, and then you can then do these computationally uh, quite easily and, of course, safely um, and cheaply. It lets them see what the consequences are that would normally take years 50 years, 100 years, if you're talking about, say, climate change. The use of these kinds of models, though, opens up a whole new way for students to learn about science, and both uh, scientific kinds of phenomena and social science kinds of phenomena as well. There's also models of uh, uh, chemical, uh, you know, chemistry things in equilibrium. There's a, a quite an interesting model of uh, wolves and sheep. You could adjust the number of sheep that you start with. You could adjust how long the sheep are allowed to live for normally. You could adjust how many wolves are in there, how you would stop the wolves getting in there. You can actually make a whole lot of decisions about the system without having to actually impact on the real system. So in one project, uh, there were these ten-year-olds and they made um, an owl, a mouse, and sunflowers. And they had the mouse, when it ate the, uh, something, I guess it ate the sunflower, it would produce turds which would make the sunflowers grow better, but then if the if the owl came, it would eat the mouse. And this was, you know, uh, and they had to think through a little bit of the science of things and, and how to model. System dynamics modeling is top-down for a start, so it looks at aggregates. It's looking at a whole system view at the same time, so what you get out of it is an understanding of the structure of the system and how adjusting one little bit affects all the other parts of the system. Something like agent-based modelling um, is bottom-up. So what you're looking at is all the individuals in a population, how they interact, and how that interaction affects how the whole system works. Uh, there's a, a wonderful model that's uh, part of the uh, NetLogo uh, programming environment. It's been developed at Northwestern University by uh, Rory Walensky's group. Is of traffic. And it basically shows little cars that speed up and slow down. And then you can control how many, um, how many cars are there. Now the cars are the agents, and the rules are you speed up and you slow down. One of the things that everybody seems to like about some of these models is how sometimes very simple models will produce kind of rich, interesting kind of behavior that is surprising. You. Imagine you're in a helicopter looking down on traffic that's flowing. That's what you're doing when you're looking at the, the traffic model. Well, what those clumps do is they actually go backwards. Some people think that the clump's going to go forward, but when you see the model, you'll see how the, the little clump happens and it just kind of kind of goes back. The traffic jam has got properties that are completely different than what the elements, what the agents have. And I think that's pretty cool, and that's an awful lot of what uh, 21st century science is starting to uncover about nature. And it really shows us that you can't just break things down into little pieces and know what happens. You have to kind of be looking at the entire system at different levels. So you can watch a model run through. You might get something like that at, say, a visitor center, at a museum. If you're interacting with a model, um, you get to make the decisions. Yourself. So there's a, a deep level of engagement there already. A number of people are exploring ways in which students themselves might create models, and that's typically called modeling. So we'll distinguish between the use of models for learning and then actual modeling. One of the challenges that you have with that, though, is in how do we have students 
program these models because it does require computer programming. So what we have now is some very interesting work that's going on. Um, Ken Kahn in particular, uh, who's at Oxford, has been working on a way to make a kind of a graphical interface so you could uh, manipulate certain things the way you want the model to behave and then it will kind of make the background computer code. So it essentially allows you to create a model without having to program it. Children and even pretty young children are able to, to um, build models and build games that you know you, you could be seven, eight, nine years old and there's some kinds of models that they would that are fine interesting and, and at their level of uh, expertise. The software that we use is quite user friendly and they get a lot of benefits, they understand the system a lot better by the end of it and it doesn't actually take very long for them to learn how to do that. And it turns out that students really enjoy these kinds of models. I find very interesting rather than just sitting there and you know, listening to a bunch of things they have to memorize. If you get the kids to use these kinds of models and they're trying out different things and stuff, um, they're really being 21st century scientists. There's been a number of papers, uh, even books, written on students using modeling, um, you know, using models as well as modeling, uh, th that have been some very encouraging findings. System dynamics modeling has been being used in education for easily 10 to 15 years, if not more. There aren't a lot of studies that actually look at learning outcomes. The research says is mixed. It says that students have a lot of trouble understanding system dynamics models. The research also says that students should be using system dynamics models because they're a great tool. They typically do need some kind of help and support, so having the right kind of environment in the classroom or also as part of um, these uh, online communities. Support might be a partner, someone going through the model step by step. Another type of support is having the agent-based model there to provide a different perspective, so in this case a bottom-up perspective. And I had some students who could use both and they got a lot more out of it. They enjoyed using it. They were engaged for the whole time. It's not very hard to turn a simulation, you know, a computer model into a game. There's two basic possibilities. One is that you become one of the elements of the simulation, so you're one of the fish in the school. And if, or you could be the kind of, uh, sometimes it's called the god figure or something. You're, you're controlling the whole thing. But it could be that you're the mayor or you're the public health official combining model making and game making works out very well. When you see these models you can start to get a sense kind of in your gut for how the phenomena behaves that then makes some of the thing the scientific ideas I think make more sense to students and so that's uh, some of the excitement that many of us who are researchers have about the potential of these to really develop very very different kinds of ways for students to experience science. Mm -hmm.